Hey guys, what's up? We're back for another episode of the Lizzie Jane podcast this week. We have an incredibly special guest. He goes by the name of Trivecta, melodic bass extraordinaire. We've been planning to this for quite some time, and I'm so happy we finally got the chance to sit down and chat his newest single, Sail Away, from his upcoming album released Friday on Ophelia Records. If that is just a tease of what's to come, I am so pumped, and we are in for a treat. We talk about tour. He just got off tour with Seven Lions and Wooly at the same time. Talk about a hectic schedule, a hot sauce, steak studio life, and so much more. Don't forget, if you love what we're doing here, make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel. Follow us on Spotify, Google, Apple Podcast. Comment, tag a friend, like the videos. It all helps and just encourages me to keep pushing. And if you want to hear these episodes ad-free, head over to my Patreon. It's linked below and linked in the description of all of these episodes. I also offer a variety of things over there from group lessons to one-on-one lessons. You get to ask our podcast guest exclusive questions. We have a private discord and so much more. Feel free to leave a comment. If you have any questions, I will get back to you right away. And without further ado, I'm Lizzie Jane, and we are about to dive in to a special episode of the Lizzie Jane podcast featuring the one and only Tribecta. The show today was brought to you by Vitaplur E-Boost Gum. With no pill to take or powders to mix, Vitaplur E-Boost Gum is a first-of-its-kind energy rave supplement that provides magnesium, electrolytes, and antioxidants while you chew. Vitaplur is the perfect complement to my active lifestyle, whether it's at the festival, on the road touring, or hitting the gym. Chew Vitaplur and dance with confidence. Use code LizzieJane for 10% off any order. Okay. Hey, Sam. Hi, Lizzie. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm here. I'm alive. You're here? I've made it another day. I'm so glad we got to finally make this work. Me too. Yeah. I remember we were at Lost Lands. You yes. were coming in. You were yeah. with Rabbits. You yep. were with Sullivan King. Yep. And you just said, when are we doing the podcast? When are we doing the damn podcast? I've been watching you do the podcast this whole time, and I'm starting to feel like... Maybe she doesn't want to do a podcast. No, I always wanted to do a podcast. Well, I'm glad we got to make it happen. We're both from Tampa, St. Pete. Do you live in Tampa or are you in St. Pete? I live in Tampa. Okay, cool. So not not too bad. 29 minutes uh, without the accident probably would have been about 24. Yeah. Oh, we got to love some good old Tampa traffic. Oh, yeah, we do. Oh, yeah. And this is the studio that you recorded your single with Fagan. Correct. Leave it all behind. Yeah, we came here uh, shortly before the pandemic. And uh, yeah, we tracked, uh, we spent a couple days in here knocking out vocals, uh, tightening up a couple lines and getting it all done. Yeah. Hell yeah. I mean, that's... Just to think of where you've gone from the time that single has been released Mm -hmm. to now is pretty wild. It's cool. Yeah, it's been definitely definitely a a climb. That pandemic uh, period in general was very much a period where like uh, when everybody sort of got sent back into their uh, 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 homes. Yes. I was sitting here like when I started this thing in like 20, I don't know, I started the doing the trivecta thing in like 2014. Um, but I'd been producing forever. And eventually I had to start DJing. And so then I, you know, you, I had to learn how to do that. But like when we got plunged back into our studios, I was like, wait, wait, wait. Now we're back on my, we're back on my terms again. Yeah, absolutely. You, you know, everybody's back on my playing field. So let me kind of use this to my advantage, you know? Oh, and you most definitely did. I, I mean, that. I would like to say that you're, you're one of the the artists that I have seen soar since the pandemic. It means a lot. Thank and you. I mean, rightfully so. You've been doing it since 2014, producing even beforehand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? brought you to make the decision to go into electronic music? Um, it's funny. Um, so I, I had been, so I had actually been like recording digitally. So like technically making what you'd call electronic music, mm-hmm. even though it was like live instruments uh, since probably 2004 or so. I mean, I was in a, in bands and I was always the one who was like t- tasked with recording us. Yes. So like I knew my way around the doll and everything like that. And, um, but yeah, ultimately uh, in college, I, I was doing that still. And then EDM got big when I was in college and Lizzie, I hated it. Uh, I was like, get this shit out of here. It was always like, boom, 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 boom. And so 
my snarky ass was like, oh, I can do this. Uh, so I so I went right at Fun fact was that I couldn't do this. It was very hard. Very hard. Very, it turned out to be, as you know, the hardest thing. That, Extremely difficult. Literally the hardest thing I've ever done. So in yeah. doing so, I ended up finding music I liked and went further and further down that path. And here we are. I think everyone who I've spoken to that has started in another lane yeah. of music, yeah. I'm very similar. I was in bands. I did the whole, I was rocker chick mm-hmm. until like 19 years old. Or you play bass and everything. Yes, yeah. bass, guitar, piano, like band through and through. Yeah. Same thing with you. Yeah. I knew my way around yeah. like Soundforge. Right. I knew my way around Logic. Yeah, yeah. But I would listen to this music. I remember I turned 18 years old. I was brought to the old amp here mm-hmm. to see Borgor. And mm-hmm. I said, never fucking bring me to one of these <laughs> again. Yeah, I said, now. this is way too much. Yeah, look at me now. Look yeah. at you now. Yeah. It's so crazy because you listen to it. And it's like all your buddies, you know, your, your bandmates, everything. That's yeah. not real music. Right, man. Right. That's, oh. that, that's not music. Oh, for sure. And then you start to understand it. And I was a little bit opposite of you where when I decided to fully do this like 2021 Mm -hmm. I was like okay I'm not gonna like incorporate anything I knew before and I looked at them as like two different entities so I started to DJ first I Mm -hmm. was like okay this is cool I was in college I was getting my degree you know just a fun little hobby thing and then you start to understand you know you go okay well I want to make my own music that was for me I said okay I've made music before I don't want to play other people's music right and then you open the door and you go well shit (laughs) this is uh this is a lot this is a lot this is a lot this is a lot yeah it's really hard it's it's really hard and and did you just kind of experiment trial and error until you figured it out yeah so my first (laughs) (laughs) my friend showed me uh my friend i'm gonna give him credit dom if you're watching this dom uh we got real drunk one night and he started showing me he showed me the bass nectar remix of lights uh yeah showed me some skrillex and so i lizzie this is this was not even me trying to be funny i thought i was on to something the next day this was probably 2011 uh 2010 uh the next day I downloaded a bunch of car crash samples and put them over a drum beat. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought that I had like dubstep. And I yeah. You so, weren't far off. <laughs> you weren't far off. Actually taking away some dubstep sounds, yeah. 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 Oh, absolutely. And you and it, you started in a time where, you know, there wasn't splice, or it was if there was splice, it was very new. Co- correct. And and you had to find all these oh things. Oh my god. It's so funny when I see like producers now, especially up and coming, like in the age of TikTok, you're like, I'm going through 500 snares and da da da. And I'm like, well, what happens when you couldn't even find the snare? Oh my and you had to create god. that shit from scratch. Oh my yeah. god. Yeah. All I had was a vengeance pack that my buddy had given me. And I had to, I remember trying to make dubstep snares by like taking part of a, the bottom of a kick drum and the top of a house snare and maybe taking a little cymbal, but then it didn't fit the song and I have to do it again. Nowadays, just going splice. And- Fading, the transients, uh-huh. all of those things have to fall in line. Uh-huh. And now you're just like, if I find some clean samples, especially if they're like ran through analog gear or something, you're like, this. I'm just going to use these forever. But the problem fine. is you still run into paralysis of choice, right? Oh, definitely. There's, I mean... I have a select set of students that I teach very beginning Ableton. Like, I don't know what automation is. I don't know what music theory is. Like, from scratch, that's what I really enjoy. And you were a teacher as well, right? Mm -hmm. You did guitar forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Eight years. That's, that's, well, you understand how cool it is to see somebody grow. It's It's the best. best. It's like such a good feeling. It's very comparable. I wouldn't say it's right in line with being on stage, but it's real close. For sure. I would get a major high walking out from teaching every day. And the light bulb goes off and and everything like that. And I would always preach to my students that like, you cannot clean a bag of shit. Like, (laughs) like if you have a shit sample, you can't make better. Like, you Uh, guys, unless you're uh, like AU5. Yeah, yeah. There are some exceptions. There are some exceptions. (laughs) Yes. No. There's some. There's some dons like like him. I would say anybody in. Like the color base, yeah, realm. they're good at that. Really, like good. virtual riot too. Yes, yes. All those guys. Extremely. Jake Kill the Noise can do that stuff. Yeah, you know, he's the one in our friend group is really good at you know manipulating. Say, he'll be like, oh, here's a like synth pad. I'll turn it into a snare drum real quick. Oh, you know? definitely. <laughs> and I mean, like speaking of your friend group, mm-hmm. you know. During COVID, Mm -hmm. when we were all, you know, there were no shows. We were all locked inside, especially on the West Coast, where Mm -hmm. everything was just, like, locked down. New York, every major city. That is when I started to see you, people like Kill the Noise, Mm -hmm. Seven Lions, um, 
Amity, right? Amity, Am- Amity yep. you know, last heroes, you guys all started like hanging out yeah. and going and the stakes and yeah. you have the music sessions yeah. and the live streams. <laughs> Were you that close with all of those guys before the That's pandemic? That's a great question. Um, we were, uh, we had all touched base um, in, in our own ways. Like Willie and I were really close. Um, Jeff and I were like, we were like friends, but not like like close, close. Um, Jake and I were uh, kill the noise, like a similar thing. Jason Ross and I, sort of similar thing. But like Jeff and Jake were really close. Everybody's so um, the Ophelia thing was picking up, and then when the pandemic started, we were like, we had just started a group chat uh, shortly before that, and when we got plunged into the pandemic, it just turned into this group chat being our lifeline. And like every day, we would all just be talking, and like we still talk. I mean, it's at the point where if like nobody says anything for like you know a good chunk of a day, I still remember Jake popping in and being like, "Yeah, it got quiet in here," you know, like that. That chat is yes. always so like that. Really, that was a, a major, major aspect of of the pandemic. I think for all of us was just sort of how that group developed. Well, we we work in an industry that lives off of a social setting yeah. and and touring all the time and traveling all the time. Right. And, you know, when I started the podcast, it was right smack dab in the middle of COVID. Ooh. And all of our conversations were the the mental impact and, and the mm-hmm. fact that we're used to being on the go all the time or we're used to going out and supporting our friends or networking or doing whatever. Mm-hmm. And all of that goes away. And then you're just left with, you know, your people that you would like to call friends. Mm -hmm. And in this industry, sometimes those people are hard to come by. Mm -hmm. And I I talk Mm -hmm. to a lot of people who are up and comers or aspire to do this or they're established artists. And and there's this like really gray line between building relationships in this industry. Oh, yeah. And, and sometimes you'll get the people who say, you know, you do what you need to do. You find the people that have like-mindedness to you and, and you do that. And then you've got people who are like, just be genuine. And the people who you're supposed to be with, you will find and connect with. Don't force a relationship. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I feel like the, the group of people that you're very close to, especially under that Ophelia mm-hmm. umbrella, mm-hmm. are genuine friends. Yeah. It really does feel like it, Lizzie. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Um... It, it it formed like that, like you said, sort of uh, like the, the point that what you were just saying about it, sort of like it just happens naturally sometimes, yes. you know? Yeah, it just sort of um, settled in a place like that, yeah. Yeah, and and when Ophelia started to like, the, the bubble started to boil, because definitely before the pandemic, there were like some talks that I would see in, in emails about Ophelia starting to form and, and people looking for demos and A&R starting to see, okay, da 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 And then... COVID happened and I was like, well, shit. And they really built up on those live streams and building that massive community. Yeah, so like, uh, yeah, uh, I'll I'll give him some credit. Jeff is a visionary. And Homeboy said, we're going to make, no pun intended, Visions, the live stream. And we were, and I did a lot of live streams during the pandemic, uh, you know. Yes. Um, We all did them. And most of them, at least for me, were pre-recorded sets, you know, you'd record 100%. in your room because of the logistics of the doing Wi-Fi. that, right? The Wi-Fi. The, the like, you Wi-Fi, can't do that shit live. Everything yeah. so much. And Jeff said, no, 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 no. We're going to make a series and do these live. And it doesn't oh, matter that there's going to be hiccups and stuff like that. And I would be streaming from my studio in Tampa to them in, 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 in Washington State. And they would be imprinting visuals on my stream. Like through OBS, through through everything, yeah. And then broadcasting that out. And it was like, and you would do it with like six different artists and there were always hiccups, but they were always able to work through them and it was always really cool. And like doing things like that and we, we, you know, we tried to stream a lot. It would be great. I would be like streaming. I would be streaming, like showing the fans or like how I work on music because I don't know what the hell else to do. Um, And then like, Jake uh, would just like, would like just pop in on my, on my, he would, he would like hop on Zoom with me and then I would just have him or Adam or anybody or, or everybody would hop in and the fans would be like watching me produce and all of a sudden all my, you know, all the, uh, all their other favorite artists would all just be hanging out together talking shit, no longer are we producing, but suddenly like one of them has an idea and we try it and someone else says, dude, your idea sucks. And like the fans are getting to see this really unique thing. So, it's yeah. such a cool transparency yeah. that you would normally not Never see. see. And Never. I felt like this like little switch happened during the pandemic that went from 
okay as an artist like you're this like unobtainable thing right. that like we see and right. you're like a figment of like our life when we're going to enjoy time at a festival or enjoy right. time at a show and then all of a sudden like we were in it together mm-hmm. with everybody yeah you become and more accessible you become more accessible mm-hmm. and everybody's going through the same things they're all going through mental ruts and then all of a sudden, I mean, I saw so many people. I saw it through my own platforms, through streams like yours, where everybody had the opportunity to learn how to make music. Yeah. Or to have these, like, great, like, everything from Patreon to Twitch to YouTube. All of a sudden, these geniuses in the music world were like, hey, there's nothing better to do. Yeah, <laughs> so, and, and now uh, through that, the amount of streams that you have on, like, recorded streams on YouTube. There's a channel like Music Production Streams or something, and it's just an archive of all these different producers just streaming production during the yeah. pandemic. And it's just like, whoa, that's a lot of resources. Like, right whoa. And I think of the, the sessions you did with Alex at Defier Society. Oh, yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. yeah, and those were really cool those too. And you just have these job. schools that are building mm-hmm. of kids who are like making really good music now. If mm-hmm. you commit to it, and you have a schedule and you put in the time. And that's what I tell everybody is like, you just have to put in the time. Mm-hmm. It's it's like honing a skill or ranking down those hours where at the end of that, you know, 100,000 hours, you're going to know how to do the damn thing. Yeah, finding the time and also finding your stride. And that's something I picked up during the pandemic was uh, what you just said a second ago sort of reminded me of this that, that, that I hadn't really thought about much. But before the pandemic, going back to what you're saying about being sort of unobtainable, Mm -hmm. um, that is something, especially in like the more like melodic bass sort of sphere that I'm in, um, it's pretty, it's pretty much the norm to make music and have your music sort of exist in the sort of world that you build as an artist. Yes. And it, you want it to feel immersive and you want it to feel like something that the fans can get lost in. And then the thought of your personality infringing upon that is kind of taboo in a way, right? It's like, oh, well, here's me, some like producer. Here's this world. I mean, they don't really coincide. So you make it very much about, and people do that for a lot of reasons also just because it's like, well, maybe I'm just not as interesting as, 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 as what I'm building and so on and so forth. But during the pandemic, um, in leveling with people and talking to them personally and relating to them and streaming with them and also like being a guitar teacher and realizing that like that I had like high student retention where I was teaching the parents loved me that I was putting on performances for the kids effectively in each lesson I realized that I sort of have more of a stride here when I let my personality shine more in the brand absolutely and, and, that was a scary thing Lizzie because like, it was like it, it was like especially in like you know my lane nobody really does that that much you know yeah. so it was like all right how because you couldn't I couldn't see a way forward how do I exist with the music they're like such separate things but but if if you can if you can do it, it'll come together. It'll make sense. And 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 I think that was a big lesson from the pandemic is like you can fight against sort of your strengths, but if you start to finally figure out a way to sort of play to them. And playing you're be to your strengths takes a while to figure it out. It took you know, forever. I feel like right now, literally in the last two months. I have figured out a way to play to my strengths. And it takes a long time. And it takes, but but I do believe that everything you've done in your like journey had to have been done to reach that point. And also one would argue that if you hadn't done all that, you wouldn't be in a position to play to those strengths. Yes. When you realize that you would have no momentum, no platform to integrate those strengths into. Well, and you have such a tight knit for someone who says that he just kind of during COVID started blending the personality and blending because mm-hmm. you have such a wonderful personality and Thank outgoing personality that. and and now you have the the meet and greets and you have yeah. such a strong community and I immediately think when you're blending your personality to your music I go where's the steak yeah. where's the hot sauce yeah. <laughs> where's all of that stuff yeah. because there's very few artists right. that have that integration where it's like this is cool. Like I think of blank with the bananas. I think of you with the hot sauces. And it's like this extra layer of we're all people. I just like make music for you to enjoy. Yeah. It it, it was hard for me at first to see. And it still is sometimes how, you know, you can keep them together, but separate. Like I still think I'm like, all right, well, all right. I do want (laughs) this music to be emotionally moving. Do I really want hot sauce to be so much in here? (laughs) But I think people can see that like, no, like, 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 
No, with like with, with with Keaton, with Sullivan King, the whole fuck mangoes thing he's got going. The music, you're not thinking about mangoes when you're listening to the music. There's a lot of depth here. You can think, okay, the yes. person behind the music. You people can compartmentalize all that, but you have to like let them do that. You know, you, you have, have to. Them. And everyone's gonna see it differently. Everybody's mm-hmm. gonna take it differently. You're gonna have fans that just like the music, and then there's gonna be fans who are like, I really like the personality of this guy. Right. I I kind of maybe wouldn't fuck with his music, but I really fuck with his personality, so that. I'm going to fuck with his there, music. I know people who do that. You know my buddy Perch. He was one of the first people to yes. show me that. Yeah, he was yeah. Like, he was like, dude, if I find an artist whose personality I like, I will like check out all of his music and go down the rabbit hole. Absolutely. And I found that to be a huge alley to success, especially within this genre of music. Cool. Where, you know, you get these, because because it is, you know, we we live in this this day and age where you have the brand with right. the music yep. and you got the visuals and yep. you got the hot sauce and you got all this stuff. And when you have a cool, intriguing brand and, mm-hmm. and I think of Reza's Spiral, Great. I think of, you know, stuff like that, that immediately grabs somebody's eye. Mm-hmm. You go, Ooh, maybe I'll check it out. Maybe mm-hmm. I'll, because all it takes is that one little thing to turn your head that leads to a first impression that leads to Maybe I don't like this, but I do like this. Mm-hmm. You got to get people thinking to latch on to. Yes. Mm-hmm. I mean, exactly. And and I mean, even at the Dabin show the other day, mm-hmm. he brought you up to play your new single. My man. And my dog. you posted already people were singing, singing the words, the lyrics. which is crazy. And that's what I thought was so cool about Dabin's show was that it was definitely more of a live music feel, mm-hmm. I would say, than over a club show where it's beautiful when you get those moments where you can hear the crowd Mm -hmm. above the Mm -hmm. artist. Mm -hmm. And that's so awesome. And I think especially in the realm of melodic bass, Mm -hmm. you get that a lot. Like you have Seven Lions, all those guys. Yeah. And and the the single is the first piece of work that's opening the door to the album coming. Yes. Wow, you're you're you you got this podcast thing down. You're good at I, weaving. I'm the trying. Concept. You know, nice. I, I I woke up this morning at 6 30 and I go, maybe you should uh do some talking points because <laughs> Sam's got a lot of stuff going on. So, yeah, but, so. But, the, but the weaving is nice. Thank, it's thank very, you. Very, I appreciate very, that. Yeah, I'll clip smooth. that little part. I'll say Sam says I weave very yeah, well. Yeah you can leave it if Come you want. Come on I, my I, podcast. I, I, you can you can yeah 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 you can use all that. No um, it's beautiful. But you gotta be excited, right? I I am. Um I am I'm so excited. Yeah, um, you know, I'm still in a spot now where I'm still dialing the, the very last. I was telling you earlier, five or ten percent of the thing. But um, but the uh, the material that's in there, I really believe in. I really like it. I think it's um, I think it showcases a, a lot more. What's what I'm looking for? The ver- a lot more sort of like range and variety while still feeling cohesive. Um, and I think it pushes things forward. And I think it takes a lot of things that I'm excited for. Uh, that aren't, you know, your just normal, typical run-of-the-mill melodic bass tropes. Um, it takes a lot of, like, those things I'm excited about and weaves them all together. And I think there's an essence to the album, I really do, that um, is palpable. And um, I think that the listeners are going to be able to feel it, too. That's that's so exciting. And would you consider this, since this is your debut album, yeah. I know right off the bat, a lot of people and artists will not do conceptual albums right. where they've got everything. Would you say this is a conceptual album or would you say this is a a high number of, of singles that you have tied together it's, and found to work well? Uh, it's a hybrid of the two. Okay. Um, it was, I did a lot of, um, a lot of gardening, a lot of planting seeds during the pandemic where I was, uh, just starting song ideas one after another, after another, after another, just based off things that were inspiring me. So in that sense, there is a common thread weaving it, keep holding everything together mm-hmm. because it was all started from the same place and you can hear all that same influence throughout the whole thing. There's a lot of like, a lot of the music I was listening to it, 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 and almost none of which is EDM. I know that's like a trope to say, but you know, but that was the case and all those sounds are sort of in there. So you can really feel it. And I did a lot of like, when I was listening to music, very focused. Why do I like this? What are these sounds? How can I recreate them? How, you know, in, in the, the type of music I make. Yeah. yeah. And um, so you can feel that. So that's all tied together. And then I did a lot of like, sending out to different vocalists, sending out, you know, and like, you know, you know, the whole meticulous, okay, is this good? Okay, can we guide this further? And then eventually you start to get a feel for sort of what it is you have. And then at that point, that's where you can start looking at the macro instead of the micro and guiding it into one place where it feels cohesive. So, did so no, I didn't start out and say, okay, I'm going to make an album that... That is a story of a space journey. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but, um, but overall, 
I, I found myself taking certain songs saying, okay, wow, this is a great tune, but it actually doesn't really match the album. So I'm going to cut that, you know, but then there are other things where it's like, okay, this doesn't necessarily match too well, but it does bring something to the table and it adds something to the album. So this one is going to stay. So, you know, there's a reason for everything on there. So yeah, yeah, it's sort of a hybrid of the two things you said. How long would you say you've been working on it? <laughs> um, there are some songs on there. I mean, there are some songs on there. There's one I was working on yesterday that I started in like 2015. Yeah. Um, you know, so that's like six, six or seven years. Um, uh, there are some songs in there that I'm ju- that I just started, you know, towards the very end because I thought, okay, well, the album needs a little bit of this. Yeah. Um, but no, I, the bulk of the work has been done since probably around when the pandemic started. Because when I put out the Everyday EP, I got immediately started on just writing all this stuff. Yes. So, and you've always been someone who has been, which I believe too, quality over quantity. Always, right. And, and we kind of, the melodic bass scene mm-hmm. does exist in a little bit of a bubbled entity mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. I do believe that quality over quantity is 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 honored mm-hmm. and 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 i do believe that that people really take their time i mean not only is it more elements you're usually working with a live vocalist right. you're doing certain things that you know in other subgenres of electronic dance music you don't necessarily have to do correct like if you're just making a dubstep banger i can go on splice i can go on other places where i find my samples Assemble. and i don't even have to work with a live right. vocalist right. and i'm going through that kind of transition now where, mm. you know, you're working with your vocalists and first you have to get the demo. Mm-hmm. Then you have to make some notes. Then you go back and forth. And mm-hmm. that's even before that vocalist gets in the studio to start recording. Mm-hmm. So it's a much longer, longer, longer process. Very much so. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and also, like, also, uh, and there are challenges to both, right? There are challenges to any type of music you make is going to come with its own challenges. But, like, for melodic bass, too, in particular, one challenge that I've always found is um, if you're making something that's not necessarily melodic, there's sort of a formula to a beat that works, right? So like 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 each genre sort of has to an extent not that many different groove or beat structures Correct. that you use. So like if you can get that beat or groove structure going and find a cool sound, then you're going. Whereas a melodic tune, you have to have your beat and your groove structure, but you also need to have a harmonic structure that moves people. And like if you and that one you can spend months trying to get something, you yes. know? So like so and then you have to find a way to combine the two. You know, so like it's a lot of work. And and there are so many melodic producers, just like any other subgenre of EDM now, that you know, it is easy to make a tune that doesn't stand out uniquely. Oh yeah. And especially and, now. Especially now. And and it's beautiful. It's amazing that there's so many producers, mm-hmm. but it's also like, how can you take it to the next level? Yes. And when I think of your album, I think of folk bass. Yes. And I think, are you going to expand on that concept in great this question. album? Yeah, great question. So, yeah. So, um, so, 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 yeah. So that all started sort of with the Everyday EP. And um, I had been listening to, I, I, I remember being at, uh, it was, it was around the time that I first started playing in Elenium's band. It had nothing to do with that. I just remember being up on the rooftop of a bar in Denver talking to a bunch of uh, melodic bass friends that had all sort of descended because Elenium was doing Red Rocks and we were yeah. all sort of there to support. Um, and I was playing in his band at the time and we were all like hanging out. And I remember saying that like m- m- so much melodic bass was either at the time, A, taking like poppy stuff and making it into like future bass chords um, in the drops or taking like trance and just mixing that with like, uh, you know, halftime stuff. And I remember being like, man, there's got to be another way forward here. And um, I was really into like of Monsters and Men and that kind of stuff. And that stuff really took me somewhere. It's very immersive in the same way that yeah. trans and melodic bass was. So I was like, well, sh- come on, there got to be a way to put these two together. So, yeah. so I started taking the one and putting the other and that's where the Everyday EP came from. So then I did, uh, then, yeah, so making this album, there's been a lot of like planting seeds and trying to come up with ways to push that forward in the way. And I, Lizzie, I exper- experimented with so many different intersections with uh, I can't folk. Imagine. And, and like, I can't imagine. some of them went full, like, hey, you know, like, and like, and I was like, yeah, it's going a little too far. But you had to try it out and see what you had. And thankfully those songs didn't make the album but there but um some of the things that but there's like one song that the second single is um the that one that one's coming soon and that one is the most folk based tune that i've made um and it's with uh rico and miela who sang on uh, okay. every day as well and yeah. so like so uh it to me it's one of my favorite tunes ever it might be a little polarizing because it's very folky but after that i love it i think it's such but it's a in tune. context of the album it's very you and, know? oh yeah and and it doesn't it doesn't do the hey tell anything yeah. uh, but um but 
I think it forges really cool new territory. And there are other songs on the album that pull different aspects of it. The same sonic textures, but maybe the vocal isn't as like, you know, campy as like some folk music. Or like certain songs that like, 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 like in Australia, they have this thriving indie folk scene. And I'm like captivated by it. And um, and and it's not necessarily, like I said, that cheesy campy folk we think of in the States. Mm-hmm. Um, but it really takes you somewhere. And I got this group Woodlock that I'm working with from there. They were on oh, the last year's so album. Cool. And um, yeah, and I'm trying to get something together with these dudes, Amistad. We're gonna see if we can make something work with them too. They're like this duo from that that also was there. And so yeah, it's all about, you know, finding creative ways to put it all together, but not go too far over the edge. And uh, the whole album is not a folk-based concept album, mind you, but there's definitely a ton of that on there, yeah. That's so exciting. Yeah. I mean, that's and and that's your your thing. That's my way, yeah. And and I remember when the single with Fagan came out, Leave It All Behind, yeah. correct? Yeah, yeah. When that dropped, yeah. you know, I had never seen so many people mention Avicii's name. Cool. And mention yeah. like like how you like embody what he did so many years that's ago. cool and, yeah and it's so cool because it's so refreshing mm-hmm. it like tickles something in your ear because yeah. you hear so many of you know beautiful pieces of music mm-hmm. but i go to somebody who's i'm you know as producers all day we could listen to it all day we could be like oh you know i really love this element i really love this vocalist right. but as a consumer i run things off my boyfriend like i'm sure you do your girlfriend mm-hmm. all mm-hmm. the time and while they're knowledgeable about music they're not sitting there like oh that frequency is a little high that's <laughs> no. that's doing definitely not. so so you know wesley my boyfriend will say you know it all just sounds the fucking same yeah. like at the end of the day <laughs> it just starts to sound the same yeah. Yeah. and and i totally get that from a consumer sure. standpoint sure. but the other end of it is that you've been able to keep that like industry standard for melodic bass mm-hmm. sound and then imprint your unique style and that's on the challenge it. isn't it and that's the challenge yeah. and and i feel like we're going to get to a point because of how many artists are really doing it now mm-hmm where you got to have that little, like, cherry on top. Oh, I'd say, you're, I'd say we're there now. Yeah. I would say we've arrived there. Yeah. Yeah, there's, 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 there, yeah. The barriers to entry are low enough now. Like, you can get in and, and figure it out and get close enough that, you know, sonically, that uh, you need, you. I would argue that we're already there, where you need to have something. There's just so many resources. There's yep. so many teachers. There's so many platforms. And I've watched people. I've watched people who don't know how to make music, bust their ass for two years, mm-hmm. and they're in. Mm-hmm. You figure and, it out. And, and, and they figure it out. But then the hard part, just like we're talking about now, is that differentiation. Because I feel like on the back end of the industry, you have like, this this like sea of like a sandbar and then there's like the water in between and there's very few people in the water in between and then there's like the 10 percent that are hanging out in the yachts on top yeah. and, and you have to figure out how to make it there because yeah. if you don't make it there it's hard to make a living mm-hmm. it's, it's really hard yeah and and it's such an investment already of of your time and and you've got to at the end of the day like if you're gonna go the the extra mile, you gotta really love it and yeah, be willing for that sacrifice. Yeah, you do. You know, wear the yeah. multiple hats, do the lessons, do the teaching uh-huh. to the point where you can confidently say, you know, I can let this all go, and I know I'm not gonna have that financial stress. Yeah, I just got there four or five five months ago. Yeah, 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 six yeah. Months, yeah, yeah. It's it. it's a huge thing that I don't think a lot of people get to see artists transparently talk about right. on, on a platform until they're going through it. And they're yeah. like, oh, fuck. <laughs> they're like, oh, shit. This yeah. is this is, this is is not good. And especially if you're, you know, in a position where you're still learning, you're still obtaining knowledge, you can't necessarily turn around and say, well, uh, you know, I'll do your mix and master or I'll teach for you or really wear that audio engineering hat if you're still learning. So right. you see so many people working two, three jobs, mm-hmm. one, two jobs, just to be able to fund their passion. And it's a, and it's considered, in my book, until you make money off of it, that you can live off of it, mm-hmm. it's not a career, it's a hobby. Yeah, I would see so, that, sure. So it's it's just quite a sure. journey. And mm-hmm. and you've, you've accomplished so many things in your career. And just Appreciate now, 
to be getting to that point is yeah. saying a lot. Yeah. Saying a lot about how the industry how is. is ran. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, Lizzie. Yeah, it it that that's such an interesting point because yeah, I remember like <laughs> I remember starting to put out music on like Monster Cat and being like, oh my gosh, my music's getting literally millions of millions. streams. Yeah. And no, 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 the, the quit, quit and teaching is nowhere even in the conversation. And to that point, it was another seven years <laughs> after that, you know, before it's I, wild. you know, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, uh, then I got into playing shows and yes. I was doing shows in 2017 and 18 and 19 and 20 and 21 and still teaching a few days a week. You know, it it's it's a lot before you can you know, before you can do that. Yeah. Because, you know, obviously in in electronic dance music, the main way that that artists make money is through touring. Right. Which, you know, was a huge concern when COVID came Mm -hmm. along. Mm -hmm. And it kind of taught everybody not to put their eggs in one basket. You know, as far as, as if something like this happens again, have that little thing in your back pocket that you know you can make money on because it was a very scary time for a lot of people. Yes, it and it's so scary. Yeah, it was. That was a time that I was glad that I did not stop teaching before that. <laughs> yeah, oh, 100%. And, and even then, you know, as an up-and-coming artist through those years, you know, just touring four or five years, you get those big opportunities that land, you know, in your email, in mm-hmm. your lap, but those opportunities very rarely have financial gain to it. Oh, yeah. Sure. So so you have to play that like teeter-totter game where this falls in line with me, but I'm going to be going below zero yep. to, to take oh, part yeah. in this. Oh, yeah. Well, back playing in the band back in the day, I got very much accustomed to the, losing, the, the yeah. losing money gigs. Yes. You know, oh, you, yeah. I would, it would be a Tuesday night. I would be teaching on Wednesday and we would drive up to Jacksonville, lose 50 bucks a piece and come back and get home at nine in the morning and I'll have to teach later. You know, so, 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 so um, I know how that works. Yeah. 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 And yeah. especially like as, as a DJ too, I mean, Definitely easier than being in a band. Yes. hundred percent. Yes. hundred percent. Well, but in certain ways. It, the like, shows are harder because it's just you. Yes. Yes. And and everything, as like a mental capacity, it does sit a lot more on your shoulders. Yes, and it's hard, you know, that aspect of playing Red Rocks, playing, you know, huge places like you played with Seven Lions on mm-hmm. his tour, mm-hmm. and then going back to your hotel room and you're all alone. Oh, and, yep. and, and then... You know, you your support on that, and and a lot of our industry is, you know, if you got this massive headliner, a lot of the times, if you don't have the same agent, if you don't have X, Y, and Z, you're getting paid from that headliner. Mm-hmm. So, you know, as the support bill or the touring bill, a lot of people don't understand that a lot of that is being taken from the headliner's mm-hmm. mass pay. For sure. And and when it comes to that, you know, if I was the headliner, I'd be like, I want the best people possible, but. We got to look at the cost. We got to look at X, Y, and Z. And then on top of that, you know, you got Ubers, you've got your flights, you've got your hotels. And and it's a lot. I mean, it adds up. It adds up. And and then when your agents and your manager takes a percentage. Oh, yeah. And then you're left with this and you got to see what you spend and you got to see what you're making back. Oh, yeah. And then you say, wow, I made 50 bucks. Cool. It's great when you just, when you're like, oh, I made that. Oh, oh, there goes, oh, 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 there goes that. Oh, 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 oh. But it's the name of the game. Sure. It's it's the thing that you it's everything's based on choice. Yep. And and you know, it's just like putting in your years to get to that point. Yes, and it's it is. so exciting yes. because you're like there. Mm-hmm. You're you're so close to like being right there. Mm-hmm. And and it's it's really cool to see somebody's journey go all the way through and know that you know, the art that you're making is timeless art. It's not just like a place. Appreciate that. That's a really yeah. good comment. And, and that. that, that will, I think long-term give you more gain and growth than anything. Could. My mom makes the same argument. So really? I can, so oh, I there we go. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> no, but I agree. I, I agree with that. Yeah. And that's always been the goal, right? Is like to make things that are um, not just like these little like you know, I, I, there there are so many people making music like that, you know? Yes. So I was like, you know, just like party music or whatever, yeah. you know? And 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 granted, I've worked myself into a uh, certain situation where, you know, uh, look, not making like club bangers and stuff puts me in an interesting place when I play DJ gigs sometimes. Well, I know? mean, I remember 
the comment, the thing that happened on Twitter when you were in the oh Wii tour. Oh, my God. Good old God. Tallahassee. Oh, Florida my State. God. <laughs> Good old Tallahassee. Should we tell him? Yeah, we should tell him. So, tell, me, tell the story. Tell the story. So I'm playing in Tallahassee. So when I play with Wooly, um, Wooly, Adam is one of my best friends. In the he world. seems lovely. I've only had a few conversations with him, but he seems super nice. He is. He, that's my brother. Um, yeah, he's great. And... Um, We've done so much together. We've made so much great music. We've had such great times together, so on and so forth. Um, uh, anyway, we when I tour with Wooly, um, for the most part, the fa- keep in mind, Wooly is a heavy dubstep artist. F- firstly, right? He's 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 expanded into a lot more melodic territory, mm-hmm. but he's still known as the dude who brings the Wooly Mammoth sized dubstep beats. So. Uh, when I go on tour with him and I play like six or seven dubstep drops in my set, I, I will maybe sometimes cater a little bit, but I really try to not do that because I they could put somebody else playing dubstep. I, I'm going to show the people. I The worst thing I want to happen is fans who know me and love my music come to the show and see me trying to keep up with dubstep acts and go, what the hell, this isn't. Then nobody wins. Then I'm just doing something that somebody else could do better and I'm not doing my own thing. So anyway, uh, so I do my thing. Um, as you should. As I should. As you should. You should make As the I, music that you play. So, 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 like, so, so, so I do this on yeah. the Wooly tour. Um, but the thing is, certain markets that I play with Wooly, um, certain markets are, are certain times there's more melodic fans. And I'm like, hey, man, that was my was favorite amazing. show of the tour. And Wooly yeah. was like, yeah, that one wasn't my favorite. You know, we usually have sort of the Different. Uh, and, yeah. And, but Tallahassee, uh, is a college market. And sometimes those college party markets, they're like 21 years old. They don't know the songs. They might not even know Wooly songs. They just know it's a dubstep show. Um, and so they just want to go and headbang for an hour and do a bunch of drugs. So um, so I did, so I played Tallahassee with Wooly and this girl sends me a DM on Instagram and says, um, <laughs> says, uh, you should retire. Um, I'm going to plant it right here. Yeah. <laughs> Right here. Like, oh, and I'm like, so, so, so I'm like, whatever. I, I like go about my life, whatever. And that the comment kind of buried itself in my brain. So, yeah. so, so I message her back, I, which is dumb. And I message her back, and I'm like, don't worry, I'm already working. But on you're it. a human, like, like we're humans. If you think you tell us that our music sucks when we've worked minimum less than minimum wage for 10 years to like make what we love, and you say retire, I'd be like. Like, yes, I know it's bullshit, but it also bugs me. Yeah, hell yeah. I'm yeah. Like, I just I just managed to make a living off this. Thank you very much. Yeah. But also, yeah. I'm off. However much you think my music sucks, my brain has convinced me a million times that it sucks ten times more. So don't you worry. I'm already <laughs> on top of that. All right. So um. So 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 ultimately, what I did was I was like I was like all right, this is good content. So I screenshot her message saying uh you you, you suck, you should retire, and I posted on Twitter and I say not sure if she's hitting on me or if she's uh or if she's serious, and uh, Twitter starts like retweeting it and then Holy she comments God. and goes that was me yeah and i was serious and then twitter just went for her and like and like and and, and the, a lot of base twitter is is an entity of its own and like Cat off. And, and like and ultimately you know she she ultimately she apologized this and that everything um and you know whatever and and you know i think lessons were learned and so on and so forth but i think the point i tried to make about the whole thing and this kind of mirrors what you were saying a second ago was like it wasn't necessarily about this comment my my point was just that i thankfully have done this long enough that i've while we all have those crippling self doubt uh, sort of experiences um i've learned through experience and you know this too when to recognize it's your brain doing its thing and when and how to understand that like you know okay i'm doing well i'm on the right path i have a fan base that supports me i've seen how much they love my music i've seen all that so i know i re- even though emotionally we don't always know i rationally know yes. but but if that had happened to me before i had created that sort of self-assurance or if that happened to another artist who didn't have that self-assurance because it hit me but i was able to sort of rationalize it away because of what i because of my experience if i did not have that experience that could have completely crushed me that could have completely turned me away from the path that i was on that could have said okay that could have been the straw that said hey sam melodic bass is not working you're like tanking you should go elsewhere you should make party music you know like a less experienced producer would have would have would have, could have gotten brought to their creative knees by that comment and um that was the point i was trying to make is like you need to be aware of that, those things you know yeah oh my gosh and that that sets an example just i mean 
not only for fans to be conscientious that, I mean, I personally have always thought it's better to really love something or really hate something because it means that like what you're doing is like in its own lane and it's like unique enough to, to be like, it makes you happy, the art that you're making. And while that matters, it's like, do you, do you want or aspire to have a fan base that's like ride or die for you, that knows the lyrics, that will buy the merch? And that's all the questions that I ask or, or I would encourage a producer that's building their fan base to ask is, is this, is this person buying my merch? Is this person going to buy a ticket to my show? Mm-hmm. Does this person matter? And you have to understand that not everybody's going to like you, but as a, a consumer and we do deal with, shitheads sometimes that are 18 to 25 years old that are just, you know, maybe not in the best frame of mind and they don't think you're going to care and they don't think you're going to see it and X, Y, and Z. And, and, you know, we're all human. And and it's hard to brush those things off. And we seek validation naturally. You know, as humans, we seek validation. We always do, especially with this. You're on stage, you got 20,000 people shouting your name and then one thing goes wrong. Uh-huh. And and you can't stop thinking about it. Oh, that's the only thing you think about. Yeah. 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 And and like and it can be challenging. You know, different people come into your life and suddenly you seek validation from a different person for whatever reason. And and sometimes you have to remember, like, yo, if I'm a sushi chef and this person doesn't like sushi, no matter what I do, you know, should I pivot to making, you know, like cheesesteaks? No, just because this person likes cheesesteaks. No. If Jake kill the noise, any pot have you have you 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 got to get him. That's, I will. That, I will. That would be the best podcast he ever had. He is one, maybe he is uh, a, a top five talker of all time for me. His I'll have to hit him up after. I'll be like, well, Sam told me to hit you up, so here I am. I will endorse his ability to verbally articulate a concept better than maybe anybody I know. And that's it's so amazing. Inter- and okay. he, he said recently that if you go chasing every sort of like thing that you think is cool or maybe the thing that you should be doing and so on and so forth, you're going to end up in the middle of the field out of breath. You know, you're going to run to this side, then you're going to run to that side, then you're going to be completely lost and totally out of breath from running around and you're going to totally burn yourself out. Well, I think like a play off of what you said right there. Oh, my lovely contact. Oh, we love it. Oh, do I just take it out? No? Okay, we're good. Nice. All right. Um, So a play on that is... What do you think? Because we we live in this like age where all of the schools of production and all of these bigger artists mm-hmm. say say getting feedback is important. So where's that fine line between getting feedback that eventually forces you to change your vision into theirs? The uh, I read a quote once that the, the the job of the president is to. Um, surround himself with uh, with people who will give him their opinions and know those opinions and those people well enough to ultimately take them and make his own decision based off of them. So I think that's the art you got to learn, how to take people's feedback and take their opinions, but ultimately make your decision based off of it. And that is way easier said than done. I mean, I was asking, I was sending us, I sent a song into the group chat the other day and, uh, and, and Jake said something effective, like this is a perfect example of too many cooks in the kitchen, you know, oh, like, yeah, you yeah, know, they're, yeah. they're all saying, Hey, you got to change this. You have to change that. And Jake's telling me, dude, if you just switch out your kick drum, I think it's going to fix your entire mix down. Um, you know, and, and things like this. And, you know, somebody says, well, this song isn't quite, you know, and then, but this song, that, that everybody's got their own opinion. They oh. do. Yeah, well, art is subjective. Art is biased. It, Everybody's going to approach it differently. It's like assembling a thousand-piece puzzle with no correct answer, and there's also no picture for what it's supposed to be, and they they could work together in a million different ways. It could also, it doesn't is. need to be a thousand pieces. You could put together ten if you want and call it your picture. Yeah. You know, so yeah. like, so, you know, use it, use as many puzzle pieces as you, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's enough to drive one crazy. Yeah. Yes. 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 Because especially, especially when you're an up and comer before you've like really For sure. gotten your little niche. For you're sure. like, well, I'm asking all these people that are better than me. So I should be listening to that. Yeah. Right. Oh, and then you change this and you do, too. who am I to say, oh, well, this is, you know, this is better than what this guy who mm-hmm. signed to this label is telling me to do. Yes. And it, and it's a very hard line that I think only through trial and error and like years of experience yeah. can you say okay well I can hear what he's saying and maybe let's apply that here but I really fuck with how this sounds yeah I mean look when I I remember um I was releasing a lot of Monster Cat um in the first like you know probably 
of they're the great. First half they're of one of my favorites. Absolute. They yeah. are some. Those, I credit them with uh, so many things. With 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 with, with launching my career. Mm-hmm. With with visiting them in person was what completely made me change my path and say, okay, I need to do this. Yeah. They've done so much for me, and I love them. And I was releasing music with them. Um, and I remember sending them Shatterpoint, and that tune. Uh, to them, didn't quite fit the vision of what they were doing, and um, and you know that you know they said something like, yeah, this isn't necessarily, in our opinion, one of your strongest, you know, but you know, keep sending. And I said, fine, whatever. I released it, um, you know, uh, 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 through you know, AIA at the time, and uh, so on and so forth. Then that turn turned out tune turned out to be one of the most like iconic melodic drops of all time. Everybody started mixing it in their sets. Je- uh, Seven Lions started playing in EDC. Um, Elenium started playing in all of his sets. Put so, you, you know, on that with rush- a lot of large, large, large It was, large, it, was large it was the song that's like it's probably one of the more recognizable melodic drops. And at the time, to me, I was like this kid who was like, oh, it got rejected. It got rejected. <laughs> yeah. I sent it to some other friends who were like, yeah, this is a little weird, but it's all right. But I was like, I think I thought I had something here, but the problem is. You know this, Lizzie. By the time you're done making a song, you hate every little thing about it. Hate it. Every little thing about it. And so, like at the time, it's it's really hard to be the one who says, "Hey, yo, screw all you. This is good because you don't think it's good anymore." Yeah. So one of the most important things I learned how to do was when I'm writing music, um, I use my notes on my phone. Yeah. And I take a bunch of notes, and usually all the notes that we write is uh, things that need to uh, be improved about the song. You yes. Know? Uh, I need to fix this. I need to fix that. But now I'm trying to make, or the last few years, I've made it a point to take notes when I really feel something in a song. Like, for example, I'm working on something and I'll write, okay, this chord progression this night gave me goosebumps. And that tells me, okay, all right, yeah, I'm going to be sick of this chord progression in a week and I'm going to want to change it. But remember that, 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 no, 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 no. So you only hate it because you've heard it a million times. Yep. You know? Oh, a hundred percent. And I have this thing where sometimes if I'm working on a project with the team, because again, you like you wear many hats. I do a bunch of stuff like yep. Foley Wise and all of that cool. other stuff where you're working with a team. Mm. And if you have a team of people working underneath you, you know, in your head, you're, you go automatically to this needs to be fixed. This isn't good. You, you think of all the bad things. Always. But if you can sandwich it, and you say, this is really great. Right. And and this gave me chills. Right. And this is this is working. Right. And you again, you leave it there. And then you write the things that need to be fixed. And then you say, but this is sick. <laughs> and then you're like, wow, okay, you're kind of in like a happy bad sandwich. For sure. <laughs> and 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 you just build off of that because I was and, and it's so true about when a song's done, you're still nitpicking when it comes out. Oh. You've listened to it so many fucking oh, yeah, just times. Don't listen to it when it's out. That that <laughs> that you are like. Wow, but have you ever gone back to your discography? I literally did this the other night laying in bed, Mm -hmm. and I had a mix that was super, like, high-end crispy. Mm -hmm. And and there was due date, it was for a remix, and I fucking hated it, and I was like, but... A lot of people liked it, and like I just had to let it go. It mm-hmm. was it was more important to have that come out with that label, uh, confident in in the song, sure. fell in line with the lane I was going down sure. at the time, than to, than to pull it because of how I thought the mix ended up. Absolutely. And then I went back and I listened to it six months down the road, and I was like, "There's really nothing wrong." It's not with as bad this. as you thought. It really wasn't as yeah. bad as I thought. Happens all the time. And and it's it's like a mind fuck. Yes. It's like all over the place. It's- um, you have to, you have to, uh, you have to. Uh, 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 Jeff said this seven lines recently. Um, completely, and, and he. It's funny because he actually failed to give any context, and we were trying to figure out what the hell he was talking yeah. about. But he, 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 in doing so, left uh, a sort of riddle that has really sort of helped lately. Which was he, he was just saying. He said to me, "Sam, zoom out." And I was like, "What are you talking about?" And then he like stopped texting back, and I was like, well, "What the hell are you doing?" But, but in doing, Jake and I were always like joking about like. Yo, Really, left us a little Da Vinci code there. However, um, that that's a great example of like like when you zoom out, things aren't what they always seem, you know. Like, and I I have uh, you know I've had so many issues even just lately on the album where when I zoom out, I'm like, all right, hang on, one decibel of clipping on this drop is okay. <laughs> like you it's know, okay. little things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you're absolutely right. Perspective changes things. It's it's all perspective, mm-hmm. and that's why I think it's important to walk away sometimes oh, for and, you sure. know people people sometimes think that they can just like bat their head against the wall and it's gonna fix it and i'm like no no yeah um <laughs> you know sometimes you'll have a breakthrough but other times you won't um, i remember like the first few years that i was doing this whole thing um i was taking adderall a couple days a week and um it was i was prescribed it and everything and i was doing it a few days a week smallest amount immediate release so it was just like a quick little few hours however 
Um, I was out of control when it came to like when to stop. Uh, you know, I, will do that it'll do that. It'll absolutely do that. And I couldn't, and I would never be able to zoom out. I would never be able to stop grinding. And I owe a lot of my skill sets, I, at least like technical from doing that, from mm-hmm. just spending so much time doing it. But at the same time, I was never able to uh, get that perspective a lot of times, you know? Yes. Hey, and I, and I think, do you, do you take Adderall now? I haven't taken it in a few years. I've thought about it for this final stretch of the album. There may be a couple of days where I dig it in the stash. I, I am but, yeah. so I am someone that that unless it's like deadline hour need to, I have not in a few years. S- same boat. Yeah. It's because I've I've seen good friends of mine who are producers who have taken it for like a decade. It's really messed them up. It can. It can. It can. It, it was yeah. actually messing me up physically was the reason I stopped was because um, I was developing issues with my hands. And um, and I've managed to sort of like let it sort of just sit at the status quo, which is very mild tingling here and there. Yeah. But I could tell it was going to get bad. And, um, yeah. And it's it, good that you listen to your body. You have to listen to your body. Yeah, you because the problem is with Adderall, I couldn't tell my body. The, the, it would just release all these chemicals that I would never be able to tell it was happening. And yeah. I would just work straight through it. Or if I did feel it, my body was just telling me that because of the Adderall is telling me, no, 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 what you're focused on is more important than that. Because in the moment, you actually do feel that because of the effect yeah. it has on you. Um, and each time I, I would wake up the next day and be like, wow, what did I do? And then the next day I'd take it again and do it again. And But now I can be more conscious, way more conscious. Be like, okay, Sam, stop. And I've been able to, you know, yes. curb it from there. Yeah, know? no, it's, it's definitely something that, I mean, even the fact of listening to your body. I mean, you were just on two tours at once coming yes, flat yes. out of COVID. Yeah. And uh-huh. and uh-huh. from someone where you have played really shows sporadically here mm-hmm. and there, mm-hmm. you know, not huge tours. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You got put on to two huge tours yep. with a multitude of dates. Yep. And, and <laughs> you have to listen to your body. You do. Because a lot of people don't get it. And they think, I mean, I was talking to Nostalgics the other day and she's like, she just got off the Confessions versus Night Base tour with AC Slater and Chami. Sick, yeah. And she was like, yeah, you know, I was just like working in the studio trying to get it done, wouldn't sleep for four days. And I told myself I would sleep on tour. (laughs) (laughs) And she said, I really regretted that decision and I won't be making that decision again. No. And, and it's like, not only can you not sleep because you think you're going to miss your flight, it's like you're getting in your hotel at, at, at 4 a.m. and then you're getting up at 6 a.m. and you're to the next place. And Yeah, one of the most important decisions I made for myself this tour was um, I am no longer going to, and I stuck to this, I said I am no longer getting kill myself flights. I'm, n- I'm doing no more. Fl- Every flight, unless I had to, was after 11 uh, 11, you Good know, you. it was like between 11, yeah. one, because I saw too many of my artist friends going to bed, uh, going back to their hotel rooms, not even to bed, back to their hotel room. Grabbing their stuff. And, well, sometimes like, that, that's the worst. That, yeah. or, but honestly, what I'm about to say is sometimes just as bad, maybe even worse, is like they have lobby call in like three hours. Yeah. So then they're like maybe asleep for an hour, but you wake up. It makes you so Hating groggy. everything. Yeah. And like, and I said, and I'd done that plenty of times and I said no more. And you know what, Lizzie, uh, a problem the 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 real reason people don't do that is God forbid your flights get delayed and you miss especially your, now especially now, especially because of how bad flights were during the pandemic and everything so like that uh, coming out of the pandemic and like and you run into this issue where it's like okay well um, get stuck am, am I gonna get stuck and am I gonna miss the show and to me I made the I decided that that's worth it um, it's it's worth that risk if I miss a show because I adopted a lifestyle that makes this Easier. sustainable yeah sustainable then fine. Yeah, I would rather, I would rather, yeah, I would rather that than not that than never miss a show, but do something that I can only do for two years because it's gonna kill me. Yeah, you know. And a lot of people get into that rut, and like you lose, you lose like this differentiation between your like personal like health, like prioritizing mm-hmm. your mental and physical health, and you know, this passion that you've worked for for so long, which is understandable. Right. You're like, oh my God, I finally have the opportunity to go and, and tour with this mass fact as support. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that this happens. You have to do a little bit of that And too. you have to, you have to, but it does come to a point where, you know, you see people burn out. Oh, and when sure. people burn out, y- you, you suffer more ramifications than if you prioritized like what you're doing and you just took the L one day. Right. You're like, ah, oh, fuck. Okay, cool. Yeah. You, I mean, it, I'll be back. 
there's yeah, I'll be back you again. You budget in a couple yeah. L's for sustainability. Yes. And yes. you know what? To your point though, yes, there are times, especially early on, but even now, where you got and there's someone to be said for those for those moments where like where you just go in that little bender to try to keep everything alive. Yeah. You know, yeah. like there's and it some, happens. Oh, and, and it's, and yeah. And it's sometimes that's some of those magical times of the whole thing. You yeah. know, like 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 sometimes when it's like when you're like, all right. This weekend, I got to do this, and then I got to fly all the way here, then I got to fly all the way back, and it's like, but it's going to be one for the books. And yeah. you get in, and sometimes, you know, like, those are some of the most, not memorable, obviously, but you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. Like, 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 like some of the they biggest They feel weekends. rewarding. Oh, like, sure. you're like, okay, and then you you take your flight home, and you're like, I did it. You're like, I did it. Uh, <laughs> Where's my bed? Uh, I did it. I'm going to die for 48 hours, but I did it. But I did it. And it feels like you just came back from war, and it's so, like... Uh, it's so like gratifying. Yeah, know? yeah. Like, I can I can die with the the sword. I won the battle. Yeah, sometimes like, playing it too. It. <laughs> sometimes caring about your you know to, to, to sort of go against my point. Sometimes if you do make it too sustainable and do make it too sort of uh, easy on yourself, you'll come home and be like, yeah, that was great. But where the fucking battle scars, man? Like, yeah, I, yeah. I just yeah. felt like that was just another weekend at the uh, in the shop. Yes, you know. Yes. Sometimes it's nice to come crawling back. Yeah, you know? yeah. When but, you're like on your last leg, but you can't. Like, I can't I do a whole water. tour. Like that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I feel like that Groove Cruise. Groove Cruise coming back from that. Oh, how was that? Um, so going in, um, I've made I've been very vocal about this. Like, I'm not a cruise person. I'm not like a vacation person. I like a day in to any sort of vacation. I start being like, all right, what am I working on? How's that? Where's the, yeah. where's the uh, how's the project coming? Where what am I doing on the album? Take yeah, some notes yeah. I'm, I'm the person who's like w- one day into vacation. Like, let me jot down some notes. You know, um, but uh, also I don't like the heat. Um, I don't like, you know, I'm well, a Colorado person. So I like the snow. That's, that's my I like, vibe. Yeah, is that. yeah. So, so, um, but Groove Cruise, uh, I, I went on it and Lizzie, I had the time of my life. It was well, all of your friends were there. That was the biggest part. Yeah. And we decided we got the drink package, probably drank 25, 30 drinks a day. Oh and, yeah. You know, like, and it was all, all you're on a cruise. We're on a cruise. Stuck there. We're on a cruise. And, and you know what? It was a cruise that was involving, uh, music. It was involving yeah. my work, you know? So I was able to like do that and 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 the people were amazing they took such great care of us the fans were great the people running it all my my, my, my squad and like but to your point i remember walking back and walking into the house and Rachel will still talk about what she saw when i walked into the house that day that, that, yeah. that i mean i was like <laughs> i was like the hunchback <laughs> you know like yeah not, you were like done done, done for I mean, my, 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 my mom was calling me on the car ride home and i couldn't pick up because i <sighs> Yeah, you're like, I can't. Your voice is gone. Yeah. You don't realize. I mean, the I went to Lost Lands for the full four days because I was doing the podcast. Oh, so I was doing yeah, I was doing a ton of them. And my set was on the last day, and I woke up and I was like, fuck. Oh no. I was like, fuck. It was like the it was everything, and you don't think about it because you know, we'll go for weeks without, like, hardly saying right. anything oh, yeah. to yeah, yeah, anybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, like, sure. have a full tank of gas for, like, a month. Oh, yeah. Because I don't go anywhere. You just say hi to your Uber Eats driver. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. I'm like, hello. Yeah. Like, yeah, hi. That's yeah, that's that's it. And then you're around all your friends and you're around all these industry people and you're around all fans and you want to talk to them and you want to get to know them. Especially if you're on a cruise ship and you're stuck with them, you might as well get to know your buddy. Yeah, for sure. And so, so it's, it's yeah. And then, and then you feel those ramifications. Oh, for sure. And like, I actually had that physically. I remember the first weekend of, uh, of tour this year um, was we did, it was the Pantheon tour. We did like, Detroit, Chicago, and Minneapolis. Huge rooms. Huge rooms. And yeah, you know, you know the armory, obviously, and everything like that. And like, I remember being done with the third night, and I had not done the on stage thing since God knows when. And yeah. it was three nights in a row of the on stage thing. And that's a few. All that I remember, I remember laying on the ground and like Emma, uh, uh, Jeff's wife, was like giving me all these stretches to do because my arms felt like they were about to fall out. And you've sockets. been training too, I know. so like you've been in the gym. But still, I, I, th- I thought that would have bought me some some sort of yeah, some sort of physical stamina or some sort of ability to gotta get an Apple Watch, yeah, yeah, see how many calories. I would be really bringing. curious. Yeah, Maybe I like will. to see because you had and you're playing live in these, right? You're bringing your guitar. Yep. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to that. Mm-hmm. Is is it a different ball game traveling? Is oh, it a different, abso- you know? Fucking lutely. Yeah, come on. I have the pure, <laughs> oh my gosh. Have I, you lost your guitar? Uh once. Okay. Uh, I didn't, but yeah, there's, no, you. there's one time I was play I was flying to Can- uh from Canada to uh to Denver and uh and I remember it was in Canada. I had another layover in Canada. Let's say it was like Montreal to Toronto and then to Denver. Um, and so so when I got to the second airport in Canada, they said, 
uh, that my guitar was put on the, the, the plane that I was just on, uh, then taken off and sent on the next flight to follow the same route. And so it was just going to be a, fl- a flight behind me everywhere I went. But, but, but I said, it, 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 it's not going to get there in time for me to play in Denver. Yeah. So I had to, it's, all, it's crazy. It was a, it was like a boutique Carvin custom guitar. I don't know anybody oh. else who has one. Um, but I actually, I'm, not that I need that guitar, but I found somebody in Denver who actually had a Carvin guitar, which is so weird. The first oh, person I talked wow. to. Um, and I carry enough stuff on me that I don't have my full setup in my backpack. But if push comes to shove, I can't do wireless, but I at least have enough to play guitar. Yeah. If, besides the guitar. So if you just yeah. give me a guitar, I can do the rest. Um, do you play with pedals or do you... Okay, so you have a, a pedal box. board. Yeah, just, just one stomp box. Um, but the thing is, where I took so much shit from my friends. So when, when the pandemic started, or when the shows came back, because I realized that I had like, to your point, you said this earlier, I had like 40 shows booked and I had, I had, I had a panic moment. Where I was like, I yeah. can't do this. So so I did, you know, what any like logical person would do. I just like bought things. So I like- Oh, I, I, uh, me so, too. So, I just buy everything. Buy yeah. so, so I bought a new travel backpack in Osprey. It's yeah. great. Um, but Lizzie, this is one of only two backpacks on the market that do what I needed to do. Because look at this. You asked if I travel differently than, than yeah. the other people. Can, can, <laughs> Can I bring a roller bag? No. I mean, no. I could, but do do I want to be walking around with a backpack, a roller bag, and a guitar case? I can't open doors by myself. So so what the solution is guitar case and big-ass backpack. Yeah. So with one change of clothes and a toothbrush. But let's say I'm playing like four days, yeah. you know? Like, um, so I need the toothbrush plus like a bunch of changes of clothes plus yeah. all my guitar gear. And so the problem is- And your laptop, the laptop and your USBs and that, your backup USBs oh. and your wireless pack. So what happens when I You get, can't even get a fucking Pelican case no, because, because you couldn't carry it. And then I'd be like yeah. this again. So, so what I found was a backpack that- splits in half so I can put all my electronic gear in one half and all my normal stuff in the other half. So let's say I get on a plane and there's no overhead space. This whole thing ain't going to fit below. No, so, no, 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 But God forbid I got to check all my gear. I'm not and trying to do that. And then you lose it. So I take the electronic part and put it under my seat and take the, the clothing oh, part if I need to and just check good. the clothing part if I have to. Wow. Um, thought about that. This. And, That's good. And my artist friends, I remember, I remember, I remember all the Ophelia guys. From especially laughing like, at you. Jeff was giving me such a hard time. He was like, he was like, man, he was like, just get a roller bag. He's like, I just have a he showed me his Toomey backpack. I'm like, huh, hey, Jeff, how many, how many fucking USB thumb drives you fit in that backpack? You know? <laughs> like, it's always a pain in the ass. It always is. But um, but it's worth it for those moments. Because you're playing. You know, you're not, if, if you were in a band, all of your shit would be in the bandwagon yes. or in the van yep. or in the whatever. Yep. But now you take this live element. And I do believe that incorporating live elements is very much so the future of where a lot of this music sure. is going. Yeah. And it's this whole other integrated aspect to traveling mm-hmm. that you oh, don't yeah. necessarily think about. None of them think about it. They don't know what we're, they don't know what we're dealing with out there. Yeah. I'm doing a lot to play those couple moments on the guitar right? for y'all. Right, right. And so you have, so you're not plugging into the mixer, you have a wireless I, pack. I initially plugged into the mixer. I was using wireless the whole time, but I, I initially was doing, uh, yeah, guitar into wireless, into the, the little pedal, uh, the amp simulator. And then that thing, I would actually run into the mixer um, where one of the CDJs would go. Ultimately, on the Pantheon tour, I surrendered to front of house. So I basically, um, you know, my guitar wireless into the little pedal thing. And then I would do that into a DI into the front of house. Problem with that, though, is you need to always, I need to always give the speech to the sound guy. Hey, man, I always say, trust me. Um, I'm going wireless. So I'm only going to give you sound when I'm playing. I'm good at this. I know what I'm doing. So just leave me live the whole night because the last thing that needs to happen is I get up and start playing and there's no sound. There's no sound. And like when it's because he's not your tech, he he's doesn't not my, know your he could show. Be anybody. They've been up there watching fucking Netflix DJs before because they they don't need to do it. They Sometimes don't need to do anything. So right, so like yeah, exactly. They They're think playing it's a night off. Right, they, that, yeah. exactly. And I'm like I'm like so just leave me. And like there have been shows. And thankfully, there hasn't been one where I've had to stop it because there's no guitar. They it's not a good look for you. You're like oh fuck. You're like great. And they don't. And the, the average consumer and listener doesn't realize that there's a guy at the back that's supposed to be letting your thing go live. They think it's on me. Yeah, they think it's yeah. Like, oh, Sam's guitar is working. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but it's like, yeah. yeah. So like, and you also don't want to be the complaining DJ who's up there and he's like, my stuff all works guys, but they haven't figured it out. So, yeah. you know, but I've thought about it. I've thought about if and when it does happen, I will probably like 
be like, grab the mic. Da, 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 da. All right, hang on. Uh, they, we were having some issues communicating with front of house. Guitar is not coming through. I ain't going to show you this without the guitar. Without right? the guitar. We're going to oh, rewind whoa. a little bit yeah. and do this thing right. And I need y'all to act as if this is the first time I'm doing it. So give me yeah, that. Yeah, you know. yeah. No, there's definitely ways to play the crowd. Yeah, you 100%. know. I mean, you were a resident DJ for years. Yeah, you know. yeah. L- playing, being comfortable in a crowd and now I get now I kind of get not like rusty but I you know it goes from you doing it every year for three days every Mm -hmm. Friday you're like yeah is it the same crowd but yeah are there different things that go on every single Friday that you have to adhere to or things that well also if it is the same crowd it almost makes it more you have to do more things I I would do a new set every Friday for like three years which is like fucking crazy (laughs) and and so now like when I go on tour it's kind of cool because like I'll be like oh I've got my songs and then let's just pull this playlist from 2000 oh you can literally pull pull from 2021. That works. I'll be like, this worked, this worked really well, so let's just throw it all just together. Just grab a little piece. I'll stress out before some shows or like if it's a festival or something and I'll just be like, Lizzie, why are you fucking stressing? Right. You have like four USBs of like 10,000 awesome songs on them. Yeah. yeah. But, but it's still, you know, to be able to control a crowd is that little cushion that you need, mm-hmm. especially if you have an aspect to your performance that could go if you iffy wiffy somewhere in the middle and and with you integrating your personality more into your project people know you so they expect that they're like oh yeah Yeah. so it it kind of it it alleviates it a little bit yes yeah it's it's the sound guys you either love them or hate them oh my god (laughs) they're either they're either like a dream or they're like you aren't a real musician you aren't getting my time. Where is my word? And, and some, like, some, most of them are great, but yes, yeah, you have yes. some. I've had some. Um, I can think of a few. I won't say like cities, but yeah. there, <laughs> there are certain ones that I very much have to go in and win them over. You know, they yeah. see like here's a guy plugging a guitar, and I'm like, there have been so many times where I've had them tell me that my way of doing it is not going to work, and I'm like, just trust me. Yeah, and trust invariably, me. after every show, they're always like, dude. That worked. That worked. And I'm like, so why'd you give me some? But I know why. Because so many other people come in that don't know what they're doing. Well, they've been doing it for so long. They have so their much. ways. They've yep. seen so much. They go, I don't know. Da, 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 da. Right. And and because I just started wearing um in ears for singing. Oh. Cool. So so again, flying colors, cool, cool, cool. And you reach that one person that's like, eh, your your router isn't gonna reach that far. Eh, we're not gonna be able to plug it into the mixer. And eh, I'm like, can you just I just, promise. Just, I know what I'm doing. Just please just, trust me. Just trust me. Yeah, I, yeah. I've been doing this. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, yeah, I got it. That's it. But it's 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 crazy. Mm-hmm. It's it's so many like aspects to the circle of the wheel that just has to keep spinning, and and but it's awesome at the same time. And like you're doing it, and I'm and it's super exciting. And and before we go, I could talk to you like all day, which yeah. is bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. um, before we go, I usually like to ask three pieces of advice mm-hmm. that you would give to maybe an aspiring melodic bass producer sure. or somebody who's really thinking about incorporating a live element, but they're scared mm-hmm. and, and, and they're scared to take that leap because of the extra hurdles that comes alongside that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. As far as that's concerned. Yeah. Well, look, <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I can't give them too much because I don't want them coming from my No, 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 yeah, if you're, it, I, I think one of the bits of, of, of advice, the first one that I would give actually goes into the second thing that you asked, which is, uh, just basically what I was saying earlier about figuring out ways to play to your strengths, um, you know, that's the big one is, and that would, that, that, and, and that ties in, in my opinion, to if you're going to bring a live instrument in the mix, like, Look, if if you have if you have a, an instrument you can play, the thing is you don't you the, the challenge is making sure not to make it gimmicky. You know that's really the challenge. You know doing it and um, but I guess the advice. I would think that things I were doing were gimmicky, and then I would talk to people. They'd be like, "Dude, that's not gimmicky at all." So I guess the advice is like, see past your own nose. You yeah. know, zoom out a little bit that's and good. think like think like, okay, hang on. Just because, you know, like, it's a really delicate balancing act between trusting your intuition and and also being able to identify, wait, 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 this is my intuition, but my intuition is being guided by fear right now. You know, so like, so yeah, you trust your intuition, but also understand where your intuition is coming from. You know, I think that's one bit of of advice. I'm going to go do that today. No, Um, that's that's great. And like, if you feel scared or if you feel uncomfortable, you're probably doing the right thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, 
probably big asterisk on probably. Prob- probably, there probably. There are things that are scary that aren't the right thing. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like, like in the ways of of creative, creatively growing. Right, I you, would say. Nothing. I would say. It, it's not like jump off a bridge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't do that. Uh, no, but to your point, it's it's very hard. Um, maybe this would be advice number two, um, or just sort of like proverb number two. Um, if you are doing anything new, um, that pushes things forward. Uh, and hasn't really been done before, it's going to feel scary. Um, mm-hmm. Unless you're one of those people that's just wired like that, which I'm not. I don't Some think most of us are. Yeah. I'm not one of those Yeah, people. you have to be able to do, so you have to like be like, hey, yo, like, so like, don't be afraid to try new things, you know? Um, that would be number two. And, um, and number three, I think my biggest thing is just always like, always... The biggest thing for me, one of the big things is just always taking notes. Always, like, when I'm working on things, always write down, like, you know, I love this idea. I don't love this idea. I don't like it because this, 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 this. And even take notes on why you feel that way. Like, sometimes I'll take notes and I'll say, hey, like, sitting in the car with this person, I felt this when I listened to this song. You know, or like, okay, the next day in studio, I felt this when listening to this part. And that can, like, you know, those sorts of things, you're not just always chasing all your feelings. You have more of a sort of a... Uh, a, a guide, you know? That yeah. This is all, 100%. I realize all three bits of advice are all about navigating the weird little mental space that you have to exist but in. But it is. Guess. It's it's a very, and it takes a long time to master your own mental space. It does. And it, it does. That's know it. when to take that advice, know when to leave that advice. Yeah. 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 And, and understand what it is. Like, if you had asked me to give three bits of advice like six years ago, I would have been like, take your the top of your super saws and chop them off and add a little white noise. You yeah, know, yeah. I would have been like, make sure your mid bass is like not, you know, like uh, 500 hertz gets a little muddy. All your instruments bump into each other there. So make sure you're, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. make sure you're being very careful there. Police your high frequency shit, you know, like, yep. you know, Know, that kind of stuff, but um, super saws aren't just saws, you got to add in other stuff, yeah. to make sound good. but like we've talked about this stuff a billion times on like live streams and shit. So, yeah. but I think it goes to say that the unspoken things like the mental capacity, like mm-hmm. those, those you know, moments when you have to make certain choices and mm-hmm. certain decisions by far outweigh the super saws, they become noise. the next frontier. Yes, they, they do. do, they do. Mm-hmm. Well, Sam. Thank you so much for coming on. You have it. a new album. I do. I do. New single just dropped Friday. It did. Sail Away. It did. That's it. Ophelia Records. That's it. Lots of things coming. Big things. Big things. Big things. Appreciate you having me. That was I great. I appreciate it. That was great. Oh, I'm so excited. Easy. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Thanks, we'll guys. see you next time.